Today I want to talk about hybrid commerce as a service and after Matt's talk yesterday about the micro microservices, I was almost about to change the title to commerce as a microservice because we are using a lot the microservice concept and I was really, really happy after the talk yesterday because it was really um, confirming what we are planning to do. Um, I don't have a disclaimer. I don't know either it's because our legal department doesn't care about it or it is not aware that I'm here. <laughs> but anyway, we're, we're in the middle of the development, so everything I'm saying you today uh, or telling you today might not be fixed and might change. So please don't, don't nail us down or me down or complain about anything. Um, some background about Hybris. We were founded in 1997 in Germany, in Munich, and then we had a merger in 2011 with iCongo in Montreal. And since 2013, we belong to SAP and are an SAP company. Our main or core product is an on-premise multi-channel enterprise commerce platform, which is really our main business right now. And if I compare it also to Matt's talk yesterday, it's the complex but easy solution. And um, we sell this solution in over 15 countries and have, meanwhile, over 500 customers running on this platform. And um, there are well-known brands like Nikon, 3M, General Electric, Levi's, or H&M that are using our platform. And Garden and Forrester ranked us as leaders and placed us among the top two or three commerce platforms in the world. But I'm not here to talk about our great um, enterprise platform. I'm here to talk about our um, microservice commerce platform that we want to provide as a service. And as our mission statement says, we want to provide a cloud platform that allows everyone to easily develop, extend, and sell commerce services and apps. And this already tells that the focus is really on, on smaller portions instead of providing one big block of functionality that you can customize, but instead having like smaller services that you can use and leverage um, for your need. What are the, the components and, and items we want to provide with our platform? In the center, you, you see basically um, our services. They are the core. It's uh, RESTful API services, which we uh, basically use to, to feed all our information to all other systems. And then we want to also provide a admin UI that is for you as a merchant, for example, you, where you can go in and, uh, for example, maintain your product data, look up orders, or look up customers. Then we also want to provide a uh, hybrid uh, on-demand multi-tenant storefront, which can be uh, slightly customized. We also want to provide um, templates that you can use and adapt to your needs and connect them to our uh, services, and you can host them and run them wherever you want. Um, we are going to provide a marketplace, which is uh, really cool because the marketplace is going to be open to anybody who signs up for an account through our developer portal and um, can basically, if, if you as a developer think you're going to provide an awesome service, you can market it there and sell it over our marketplace. And you as a customer can combine your services there through the marketplace. And basically the last thing, and that's how most likely most customers will use it, they will use our services directly and basically just integrate them into their website or mobile apps. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about this, this approach and, and how, you, how you enable um, your strategies in the cloud with the, with the commerce RPs. And there are three main use cases we can think of. One is, is basically you have an existing website and um, you want to, want to transform it step by step into a uh, commerce platform. So you probably would want to start with a catalog browsing functionality, a product detail page, and so you would start consuming um, product detail and catalog services from our site and integrate them in your site. And then maybe in a second step, you would want to go over and, and start uh, providing a, a card or a checkout. Or um, you already have an existing commerce website and you want to enrich it with, with additional services that you want to provide. For example, in, uh, on the product details page, you want to add additional uh, review service or anything like that, or in the checkout you want to provide um, shipping cost calculator that you can, uh, <clears throat> sorry, you can include that into your checkout. And then the last, and I think it's the most exciting part, is 
that you can uh, use it to build uh, consumer-focused functionality in apps like in-store apps or Internet of Things that you can connect with, um, with our services. Um, for example, our labs did, did a demo with, um, with a wine shelf where you can go in with your mobile app and you, you answer like six questions and then based on the six questions they will direct you to the right wine <clears throat> on the wine shelf and you can book it out and it's all connected with an e-commerce system in the back. So those APIs should really enable you to do this in the future of, uh, for your own business. What are the, the key aspects that we, we um, follow or wanna, wanna achieve with, with our platform? It's AP first, we really wanna focus on that the API is the, the main interaction point. Um, we use RAML, that's the uh, REST API management uh, modeling language to define our APIs. And for our um, apps, we want to really be mo mobile first. We do responsive designs. Our demo store is, is from scratch. To, uh, um, sorry, our multi-tenant store is designed from scratch to, you, to be responsive. We want to be open to everyone. That does mean that we, you don't have to be a partner and go through a partner um, validation process and need certified developers and so on. It's really you as a developer should be able to create an account and start working and developing with it. And also um, pushing your application to sell them through our marketplace. And the last thing is we really, we really focus on an open technology stack because we think that this will help us to, to increase the reach of our application and to get a lot of developers on board to, work up, uh, to develop applications for us. So how does our microservice architecture look like and how is the, the general setup? Um, we have um, our backing services running on the, on the infrastructure as a service. We set up our own monitoring and logging. For logging, we use uh, a combination of uh, Kibana, Logstash, Redis, and Elasticsearch, where we're grabbing the data right from the, from the Cloud Foundry uh, syslog stream. Uh, monitoring, we're using right now um, a solution where we have Riemann in between. And then um, basically, as an, as an UI, we use Graphite for, for all um, monitoring data we collect from the application, from Cloud Foundry and from our backing services. Then on the Cloud Foundry side, we have our marketplace deployed in there. So it's gonna run in Cloud Foundry as well and gonna be connected to our APIs. And we have the dev portal and the dev portal is, also, is providing all our documentation and what I think is a really good idea is that we also deploy um, our documentation of our APIs and services in parallel with our services. So when uh, through the continuous integration, a developer updates a service from us, he also up, has to update the documentation and the documentation gets pushed to the developer portal with the deployment of the application. This way we wanna, wanna make sure that our documentation is also in sync with our APIs. Coming to our, our services itself, we have at the bottom, we have our core services. They are basically um, the abstraction layer to the backing services. We are not using the, the service broker from, from Cloud Foundry. We are using our own services that talk to the backing services and manage the multi-tenancy there. And then on top, we have the, the commerce services who only talk to the core services and we have the API mashups. Um, the API mashups will be the, the primary method to compose and aggregate services and um, the services will be, you can combine services there for the context, for device specific information, um, or for process information, um, for process context information. And the uh, mashups will be also then available in the marketplace for um, adding, subscribing it to your package. And then on top we have, we have our applications like um, the multi-tenant store or the back office application. So here you can see um, a particular example of, of, um, of a call stack of a typical one. So we have a demo store, and then um, there's the checkout mashup for like capturing um, the card and the product and uh, payment information and so on. And those services like the commerce services like product service or card service are talking straight to the document repository service, which is like one of the core services you saw on the previous slide. 
And those abstract basically the access to their MongoDB. So they take care of, of or the document repository service takes care of the persistence and loading data. So for a higher level um, um, API developer, it's, it's pretty easy because he's developing to a predefined RESTful API of the doc document service. Then we also have a, a PubSub Hub service, which is connected to Kafka. And basically, the PubHubSub is, is there for um, publishing events. So for example, if the order service creates an order, he would provide or uh, publish an order creation event and other services like, for example, um, an email service would listen to it and send out an e order confirmation email, or um, you could connect it to an uh, analytics service who basically then stores the information and, and provides them to business intelligence or analytic data. Um, we also managed to um, set up and, and scale our MongoDB through Bosch. We just finished that recently. So um, whenever we have the need to, to scale up MongoDBs or, or create new replication that set, we do that through Bosch. Um, and the same is for Kafka. So we are really looking forward to use Bosch heavily for uh, managing our whole um, backing services and environment there. So we, we are really start, uh, we are really liking the way Bosch is working and we want to use it heavily and not like also add additional components like Chef or Puppet. Next I want to talk a little bit about our project history and uh, so the funny pictures here is, is basically they're representing the names of our, our teams. So uh, for example, pre Team Priceless is, is responsible for um, our whole uh, order calculation, card calculation, um, subscriptions. Um, and the specific about it is we started in January with a project and we ramped up our teams there. So we have 12 teams on the on, on, the on demand part and we really separated that from, from our on-premise uh, model because um, we had to come up with like a total different um, mindset to develop it. And we develop in three locations. It's in Poland, Gliwice, in uh, Germany, Munich, and in Montreal, in Canada. We had our kickoff, our project kickoff in February. And in mid of February, we had basically our first um, Hybris Developer Bootcamp. And the Hybris Developer Bootcamp was there to basically educate and train our developers on the concept of 12 factors and microservice. Because if you remember the talk yesterday of Matt, enterprise software, easy. Um, what did he say? Yeah, he said uh, comp easy but difficult. And we have we have now with the microservices we have simple but complex, uh, simple but difficult. Sorry, now I got it. <laughs> And so we had to, to educate and, and train the developers on 12 factors, like that their service have to be stateless. What is a backing service? How do they use backing services? And that they have to do, declare all that dependency in, in explicitly and isolated in their, in their um, build packets and, and um, deployments. And also on the microservices, we had to um, teach them that they really have to work in simple and small responsibilities and choose the best solution for the problem, which means also sometimes choose the best technology for your problem. Back then, we didn't do the bootcamp with uh, Cloud Foundry. We used Days.io as, a, as um, a demo system for deploying and teaching our developers for that. The reason for that was simply we had it already installed as a, for evaluation, and we just increased it a little bit, the, the, um, the VMs, to, to make it possible and work for the code camp. Uh, and we didn't have time in a, within two weeks to set up a full Cloud Foundry installation and get into the topic. But we got it running in March. So we installed our first Cloud Foundry in installation in March, running on AWS in North Virginia. And the transition from the days deployments to, the, to Cloud Foundry was very, little because, or very little effort, because we only had to transfer um, some kind of, Days was also using build pack, and so we had only to make some changes to the manifest files and the configurations of the application, and it would run automatically on Cloud Foundry. 
since May, we have a second instance of Cloud Foundry running in, in Europe. Um, it was a little bit more difficult to set it up because the default Amazon settings are always pointing to North Virginia. But we got it running, and the reason for that is we want to have a second in environment to also educate our teams to work with uh, test and development environments and production environments. And the EU environment should um, already present and, and um, be there to help our um, developers to think in DevOps and use this as a production environment. Another reason for that is whenever we want to do updates and on Bosch or Cloud Foundry, we want to use um, one environment to deploy it first and test it there before we roll it out to the other. When I made the, the presentation, we had 35 different apps running on Cloud Foundry. When I looked into it this morning, we already had like three or four more. So it's, it's really, really growing how our team's developing, and, and it's really amazing to see with what speed they're developing new apps and adding it and deploying it to Cloud Foundry without having us to do anything. And we use um, about eight different build packs where one is really specific, and I, I'm, I'm really happy that we made it work with it. We have our multi-tenant storefront, and it's a AngularJS, Node.js, Bower um, application, and there was no out-of-the-box build pack but we found a multi-step build pack, and so with three other build packs that we defined in there, we made it able to deploy it to Cloud Foundry. And the milestone for our first internal release is end of June, and this um, will be the first time that we give over our microservices to internal teams to play around labs and our solution engineering. At the end, I want to show just a little bit of our technology zoo that we are having. And um, everything that is yellow here is basically all operated by, by my team. And listening to the, the, um, the Axel Springer talk yesterday and learning that they are two people as well to operate their Cloud Foundry and all the services, I get the impression that two is, is the standard number of operating people you need to operate Cloud Foundry and backing services. You can reach me uh, on Twitter and or at rene.welches at Hybris. Thank you so much.